Thank you all for coming and uh, thank you for just being here. So, So uh, my talk is entitled Ready for Combat, Women and Militarized Arms Struggle in Southern Africa. So I'm looking at the region in Southern Africa that's, uh, if you sort of picture the map of Africa, you know, so I'm looking at Angola and Namibia, so those are the two countries that I'm mostly focusing on. And during the 1950s, late 1950s to the 1980s, that was the region that was like a bedrock of armed revolution and against, you know, the, the context of uh, the Cold War era. So all these international sort of um, ideological fights were fought in our lab specifically. So we had Cuba getting involved, supporting the MPLN government. Then you had the USA and South Africa on the other side sort of supporting the other armed groups. So, so it's all about, it was not just uh, an African issue, it was more of like an international issue. So that's why I'm sort of looking at this specific period just to put everything in context. So what motivates women to join armed insurgent movements? What roles do women combatants play in these movements? And who really counts as a participant in armed struggle? The answer to these questions requires a rethinking of the relationship between gender, militarism, and nationalism. It calls for complicating the dominant narrative that considers war as an exclusively male domain, while peace and peacemaking as a women's sphere. Such constructions of war, I argue, ignore and minimize the active role that women play in militarized organizations and consider violence as the preserve of masculinity. Additionally, these narratives, I argue, reify the gender norms that box women, especially African women, in non-confrontational roles by de-emphasizing their, ins their insurgency activism. The androcentric approach to armed struggle, as well as the accounts that emphasize the lives of leading heroes in armed revolution or leading heroines in armed revolution movements, understate the presence of women as actors and stakeholders in armed struggle. And here I'm assuming um, all of us are familiar with the United Nations Resolution, Security, United Nations Security Resolution Council 1325, which sort of came in 2000, sort of um, help bring women or put gender at the center of, um, of militarism. So this paper therefore not only highlights why women become involved in armed struggle, but it also seeks to redefine the boundaries of what it really means to be a participant in armed struggle. And this idea of who participates is what's central to my, my specific project because it, as I will show, there are certain voices that tend to be marginalized because they're not seen as masculine enough, or they don't count as revolutionary you know, lives. Even though this paper centers the experiences of women combatants, I am also cautious not to romanticize their lives by recalling the images of militant African women carrying babies on their backs while holding rifles in their hands. And we are all familiar with these images, whether it's not just in Africa, but in Latin America or Asia, where you know it's always that idea of revolutionary motherhood. But so as we romanticize such, such images, it's also important to actually realize that patriarchal and power relations with sort of um, ideologies that sort of embedded in that specific image. So my analysis, of course, is inspired by feminist scholarship that sort of looks at you know the intersections of gender and militarism and, nation, uh, nation, and nationhood. And in this case, I'm looking at Catherine Cork, uh, uh, Jacqueline Cork from South Africa, Cynthia and Law here in the US, who's done extensive work on militarism. And these scholars actually remind us that not that militarized militarized organizations are not gender neutral because the ideology of war and militarism produces, interrupts, and mobilizes gender in gender identities in ways that promote patriarchy and other patriarchal practices. These scholars also remind us that in wartime, women and girls specifically experience armed wars in different ways from men. I, I urge us to immerse ourselves in the complex experiences and stories of women in wartime Africa in order to push against the discourse on militarism already over-determined by male experiences. I therefore focus on women combatants in Namibia, which at the time was called Southwest uh, Africa, and in the leading organization, national organization, SWAPO, Southwest Africa People's Organization, 
uh, and its Amduin clan, People's Liberation Army of Namibia, and in Angola, I specifically focus on uh, MPLA, which stands for Movement of Popular for the Soldier Angola. So what were the push factors and the pull factors that sort of helped to see how women got involved in armed struggle? And I sort of look at these push and pull factors in three categories. There are those like which women are most of them like motivated to join armed revolutions because of the nationalist ideology. This is a desire for self-rule. So you see all these um, leaders, whether it's in Angola or South Africa or Namibia, sort of push women to sort of join the struggle to fight against colonialism. And then the second factor I think for most women, and this was so true for women in rural areas, was the desire to actually see peace and security in their communities. So you have women sort of saying, you know, because of the experiences of war and seeing, you know, witnesses, witnessing the horrific um, massacres every day in their lives, that push them to sort of, you know, play the vigilante role in their societies. And then another factor which is, I think is also important to me and very complicated is this idea of feminism in Africa, you know. So where women, did these women see themselves as feminists, a part of, you know, this larger movement, global movement that were saying, you know, if I fight, I'm empowering myself as a woman. You know, some kind of, those, like, that second, that third uh, factor to me is, it needs much more complicated. It needs to be complicated. So women's insurgency activism, activism in Southern Africa is very unique, okay? So my analysis in insurgency in Southern Africa when it comes to women focuses on the leadership roles. Uh, I argue that that analysis that focuses on leadership roles is very limiting because it does not adequately address the context of women's activism. One problem is that the focus on certain leading actors, specifically male, uh, contributes to the invisibility of African women who engage in everyday acts of resistance. And in this case, I'll sort of later on, I'll read at least one narrative, sort of see how women in their daily lives sort of um, uh, had this militant approach to life or to, to the armed struggle, which in dominant narratives would be assumed to be not you know, militant at all. Okay. So, so these women engage in what James Scott actually refers to as everyday forms of peasant resistance, such as you're know, refusing to give food, to the, to the South African apartheid regime, or refusing to talk to them, or refusing to open the doors, or simply just saying, you know, you know, engaging in acts of violence, random acts of violence against you, overturning the cars of the military, so that South, South African military. So. Moreover, the emphasis on the leadership positions of women combatants in the highly hierarchical structure of armed movements fails to take into account that many African women who joined armed movements uh, would not be considered leaders regardless of the tasks they performed, because these women joined movements at a very young age. And in the case of Angola, we have women joining when, as early as the age of 14, or even 10, they're really being forced to, have to take up arms and defend themselves. So the question of age is very important and cannot be overlooked when analyzing the roles that women play, because in most African political systems, especially in Angola, leadership positions are defined on the basis of seniority of age rather than sex or gender. So this is one thing I'm sort of trying to really uh, uh, make it relevant because when we focus on leadership roles, we tend to sort of marginalize the voices of young girls because they're not in the context of Africa or Southern Africa, they don't, they don't get to be seen as leaders because they're too young. But actually they did play very important roles which of course may or may not have been you know, equal to those of the male leaders. Another problem is the distinction made between combat and non-combat roles. Studies on regular militarism define combat roles to include military activities such as heavy tank and covert operations, scouting, and operation of specialized missile systems. These roles are distinguished from non-combat roles, which are defined specifically as those tasks performed by individuals who are not directly engaged in direct combat. So already there we can see the problem when it comes to analyzing women's roles in, in arms, armed movements. So this essay resists the temptation to create rigid categorizations of different roles women played, whether they were active or not, or whether they were in combat or non-combat roles. My argument is that by emphasizing the dichotomy between combat roles and non-combat roles, uh, that distinction uh, not only diminishes the agency of women who chose, who chose to join armed movements, but such distinctions also reinforce the dominant narrative that views African women as a, as a political and passive victims of war and conflict. And this is a narrative that 
whenever we hear stories of war in Africa, it's always, you know, women just, you know, being active and they never participate, being passive and never participate, as if they lack any agency. It is also important to acknowledge the actions of women who have been characterized by Cynthia and Law in her book as camp followers. Camp followers, Cynthia says, as, uh, describes them as women who simply follow male soldiers and whose duties included laundry, tailoring, nursing, cooking, and allocation of provisions. But what about those women who provided sexual pleasure to male combatants? Do they count as active participants or not? So women's roles as wives or sexual partners when there in male revolutionary needs for affection, self-affirmation, and conquest cannot be trivialized. I argue, as Fanon reminds us in Dying Colonialism, the woman for marriage progressively disappeared and gave way to the woman for nation. The young girl was replaced by the militant and gave way to the woman for action. Uh, the woman ceased to be a compliment for man. She literally found a new space for herself, for herself by her sheer strength. So that's from Fanon's uh, 1967. So for women combatants, participating in armed struggle meant that they were constantly aware of the fact that in the, in the context of war, being a woman requires one to perform a double duty of being an insurgent as well as without pushing their roles as mothers and wives to the back banners. Nevertheless, what, cannot, what, I, what cannot be emphasized enough in the life histories of the women combatants that I look at in my work is that while many of the women consider their participation in, in, organize, in these organizations as a way for them to challenge traditional gender norms, Many of them could not escape the various forms of gender-based violence that come with war. Research continues to show that in wartime, women's bodies are always accessible battlefields because rape is often used as a, uh, um, as a weapon of war and terror. However, without minimizing the gravity of violence of war and armed conflict on the African female body, I posit that it's also necessary to embrace an all-inclusive definition of armed struggle one that considers women insurgents as active participants in armed struggle because they identified with the goals, ideologies, and efforts of the struggles, at least in the case of Angola and, uh, and Namibia. And secondly, just as citizens, they provided a wide, support of, uh, wide range of support of, to armed movements by contributing in terms of their labor, supplies, and assistance in the general efforts of the war. Such an approach to armed struggle and women's insurgency does not automatically reject or downplay the complex and often contradictory tasks performed by women. So here I'll sort of just read one um, narrative, sort of just give you an idea of the, the, the different ways that women engage with activism. So this is from um, a manual that uh, every South African uh, military officer was given and they were supposed to actually recite it before they go to war and uh, a little bit disturbing but so so the manual says the Bantu woman should however be closely observed for the following reasons one she provides food and is the best and is the beast of burden to the male combatants it will most probably be her duty to provide the insurgent calm food and beer and she may carry heavier automatic weapons, as it happens in Angola all the time. Secondly, she incites the men to, successfully, uh, to successful military action by arousing them sexually before the battle. Experience has shown that the Bantu will take, will take advantage of the weakness of whites who do not treat women roughly by pushing the African woman to the front lines of war. So just within that small quote, you can see how Yet the difference of the nuances in terms of women's participation in armed struggle and how they are viewed by the South African military. So where, where do we go from here? After looking at these narratives, my biggest question is, so what do revolutions do for women? Okay, We can see what women do for revolutions, but what do the revolutions do really for women? And there's a section like, this is a section I'm calling the unfinished business of armed struggle. Scholars on women and militarism in Africa have noted that although women actively participated in liberation movements, okay, and in revolution struggles to create democratic and secure spaces for themselves, uh, uh, the gender insensitive policies of national reconstruction and peace buildings are often gender biased. 
as one Namibian combatant says, I was confident that, that those of us who had spent time in our youth in the struggle and had returned at home at an advanced age would be considered for employment. The day of my hopes and dreams never came. I realized that my expectations of independence had been based on a false dream. So this idea of false, false dream helped me to examine what women do for revolutions, but then what do they get from the revolutions when the wars come to an end?